What a great story it is. For 350 years, this church, amidst the teeming masses of Manhattan, has been helping people, helping them with their personal problems, their difficulties, their sorrows, their frustrations, their moral and intellectual problems. One human problem which has impressed me greatly of late is the prevailing incidence of a lack of self-confidence. Despite aggressive signs to the contrary, it seems that a vast number of people are plagued by feelings of inferiority, inadequacy, and self-doubt. Surely the gospel has something to say about this. And I find that this situation is not only a matter here in New York City, but it seems to prevail everywhere in the world. A few weeks ago in Hong Kong, Mrs. Peel and I were entertained at dinner by the staff of our guidepost kindergarten in May Fu, where some 85,000 people have moved into a magnificent new housing development. At this delicious Chinese dinner, I was seated beside the one girl of the staff of 22 who was able to speak English. But I found that her English was so mixed up with Chinese that it was quite difficult to understand her. But she turned out to be a lovely girl, but she had a plaintive quality about her. She said, you know, sir, I hope that sometime I can get to believing that I can handle life. I feel so inept, and I wish that you would pray for me, that I would have self-confidence. And I assured her that I would. A few days later in Calcutta, we were stopping in the Oberoi Grand Hotel, and we went down to the coffee shop for breakfast. There was a table of four, three Westerners I took to be Americans, and one Indian man. I noticed them talking among themselves, and finally the Indian man came over to me and addressed me in that gracious way that only the Indian people can affect, where the hands are brought together in a, such a, a loving attitude. and. He bowed graciously and said he was glad to meet me. And I told him that I was glad to meet him. And he said, I know you're busy. I will not hold you. But he said, I have a very great responsibility that means everything to me and the future of my life. And I don't feel equal to it. Will you bless me? And will you pray for me? And he said, I mean, bless me now. So I put my hand in the same way. And I said, dear Lord, bless this dear friend and give him self-confidence in his responsibility. So it goes everywhere. Now I look out at you this morning and you all look very composed, very competent, equal to any situation. But you and I know, don't we, that it is the mark of a sophisticated person to dissemble. That is not to reveal on that outward facade known as the countenance, the inner problems and frustrations. And it is a fact that in a deep and pathetic sense, all of us are as, at times at least, as frightened little children in this great big world with all of its 
complexity. And we want to know how to stand up to it with confidence. That's what this church has been teaching for centuries to the people of this burgeoning city, of this still growing dynamic nation, that we still have the ancient power among us in the name of God, that we can handle our lives and handle them effectively. How then does one develop real self-confidence? I would say that the first and primary factor is constantly to build up a body of faith in your mind. Ultimately, your mind will always give back what you've given to it. If over a long period of time you give to your mind inferior feelings, inadequacy feelings, self-doubt feelings, you will become of that fashion. But if constantly, on the contrary, you read the Bible, you go to church, you associate with spiritual people, you think spiritually, you pray in depth, you will finally build up into your mind such a power of faith that no matter what crisis may develop, you will be equal to it. And don't you think that crisis will not come to you? We know not the day or the hour, says the Bible. Ah, you could go even further and say we know not the minute when some tremendous, overpowering challenge of crisis may come to you. The question is then whether this faith has been built up to such an extent that you have the inner power to meet it and the inner spiritual perceptiveness and wisdom to handle it. For example, there's a friend of ours, a writer, in one of our magazines, who is a buyer in the New York market. She buys for a store, I believe, in Denver, Colorado. And on one of her buying trips to New York, she learned that one of her old schoolmates was living uptown somewhere in the Columbia University section. So she called her up and asked her to come down and have dinner, go to a theater, and have a nice evening together. Apparently there are a couple of talkative ladies because after the theater was over, they hadn't finished their conversation. They went into a night, all night restaurant in the Times Square district to continue their chattering conversation. Presently, to their astonishment, they noticed that the hour was 2 a.m. It required now the girl from uptown to get back to her place up near Columbia University. Phyllis, the girl from Denver, suggested at that hour of the night she should take a taxi because it wouldn't be safe to be on the streets alone. She said, oh no, the subway goes right by my house. It's only a step and I'll take the subway. Will you see me to the subway station? So the two girls went to the subway station. They went down inside and trains are irregular at that hour of the night. There were a very few people in the lonely station. And finally, the train came along. The one girl got on. They waved at each other. The doors closed. The train disappeared into the tunnel. And now Phyllis was alone in this station where suddenly she realized there was not a single human being. A tree more of anxiety crossed her mind. But she said, this is in the middle of civilized New York City. I'll be all right. And she headed for the gate only to find that five obviously very tough boys emerged from uh, the shadows. And they lined up between her and the gate. And one of them with a sneer said, uh, you're out pretty late tonight, aren't you, baby? 
And another one said, Would you like a little company, sister? She froze. She thought of her husband at home with her two little children. She thought, I'll run. But she knew that they would catch her. She said, I will fight them. But she knew that she would have no chance whatsoever with five muscular looking tough boys. She said, I will scream. But then she realized that her screams would go unheard in the loneliness of the station. There she stood, and then a thought came to her. A thought out of this book. A thought out of the book you gave me, which says, I will be a shield and buckler to them that walk uprightly. You see, it came out of her consciousness in which she had put faith for all these years. And she said, that's it. I will walk tall, like it says. And she proceeded, and then she heard a voice, which she recognized finally, strangely, as her own voice. And with firmness, it said, let me pass, please. Let me pass. She proceeded further towards the boys who were unmoved. And again, let me pass, please. Let me pass. The boys on either end looked at the boy in the middle who was obviously the leader. He gave way. She passed through, walking her full height of five foot six. And as she passed by, one boy with more perceptiveness perhaps than the others said, that's it, walk tall, lady, walk tall. And she did walk tall until she got to the stairs and then she ran. <laughs> Fell down on her bed in her hotel room and thanked the good Lord for her deliverance. And well, she should thank him, because in a crisis, this lonely girl had put such a body of faith in her mind that it overcame the cynicism of five street toughs who would have perhaps destroyed her life forever. You see, that is what the church has been teaching over all the years, that life is tough, it's difficult, it's intricate, it's complex. Its onslaughts can overwhelm you, but not if you have the body of faith built up in your mind. In this, says the Psalms, I will be confident. Of course, a lack of confidence always indicates the presence of fear. Fear, says a distinguished New England psychologist, is the most destructive element known to mankind. Worry has been pictured by ancient hieroglyphics in Britain, which were recently discovered, as a great gigantic wolf sinking his long teeth in the neck. Even back there centuries ago, they knew that uh, worry could destroy. Anxiety, says our old friend Dr. Smiley Blanton, the famous psychiatrist, is the great modern plague. And thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people are riddled with it. And that's one reason in this church over all these centuries, we've been telling the people in the name of Christ that they can be freed from the victimization of fear, anxiety, and uh, worry. 
But yet, you know, we, we become fearful in childhood as little children. I think we're born into life without it, except the fear of falling or loud noises. But we live amongst uh, people who are afraid, and gradually we take it on. And it rises up to seize us at the least unexpected moment. I remember going down into Texas one time with a friend of mine to make a speech at a big meeting down there. This was a long while ago. This man's name was Al Hockey. He, in his time, in my opinion, was the greatest platform speaker in the United States. And we were going down there together to speak, and we were flying from Dallas to Brownsville, Texas, on a DC-3. Now, probably there's no one here old enough to remember a DC-3. But I remember it seated about 26 people, and when it was parked, you had to walk uphill inside to get to your seat. It was small. And in a storm, it could be uh, thrown about like a leaf in an autumnal wind. But they were sturdy. And I went down there with Al. And between uh, Dallas and Corpus Christi, we ran into the worst storm I've ever been in in an airplane. Bar none. I was in a 747 off Tokyo not long ago, and it was so violent that I was momentarily in favor of returning to Tokyo. But we didn't. We went right on high above it. But this, uh, this DC-3 couldn't get over 15, 16,000 feet, maybe. Might be 20. And this was a violent storm. And... Uh, I began to become a little alarmed. And I said to myself, why are you down here in Texas riding in this airplane? If you would just stay in New York and attend to your own business, you wouldn't be in this situation. And I said to myself, when I get to Corpus Christi, so help me, I looked on the map to see how far it was to Brownsville. I said, I'll hire a car at Corpus Christi and I will drive with Al here to Brownsville. And I looked at Al, and his face was alternately white and green. <laughs> so we finally made it to Corpus Christi. And I was about to take it up with Al that we take a car. And he said, Norman, uh, you know, if it wasn't that uh, we'd be a couple of cowards, I'd suggest we drive in a car to Brownsville. <laughs> I said, Al, I am ashamed of you. <laughs> He said, I know I'm ashamed of myself. I said, to him, maybe they won't go. Maybe they'll cancel the flight. Just then they called the flight. I looked at Al and Al looked at me. He said, well, the Lord's watching over us. Let's go. We got back on the plane and a man tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, I beg pardon, sir, but are you Dr. Peel? I, I said, yes, that's my name. He said, well, would you mind uh, if I sat with you on the rest of this flight? <laughs> he said, I'd feel more confident riding with you. I said, that's okay by me, but you don't know what a slender reed you're leaning against. <laughs> but now that I had to hold this man up, and as well hold Al up, I, I, I felt uh, this, it was still rough. But you know, the mind had to smoothed out. And there was a confidence there that uh, the Lord would take care of us. Fear is a mental element. Think fear thoughts, you're going to have fear reactions. But if you shift over from the fear thoughts to confidence that God is with you, watching over you, and taking care of you, then uh, while the fear may not pass away, you will be in control of it. Fear not. I am with you. Peace. I give unto you. 
not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now the good Lord gave you mental power. He gave you health of mind, soul, and body. He meant that you would be able to walk through life unafraid. And that by so doing, you would handle life victoriously. So the first thing is to build up a body of faith. And the second thing is to deal with the matter of fear so that you stand up to it, knowing that if you do, you are greater than it is. Emerson, who was perhaps the greatest thinker in many respects who ever lived in the United States, says, do the thing you fear, and the death of fear is certain. Finally, self-confidence comes by a revision of personality, whereby self-doubt and fear are brought under subjection. Always through all the history of this church and others all up and down this street and down this land, the gospel has been preached and is still being preached that the secret of life is to have your life changed, whereby you are no longer victimized by the weaknesses of the flesh or the weaknesses of the mind, but you are controlled by the power of the Savior. And he's well named by being called Savior. He saves us from ourselves. He saves us from our fears. He saves us from our weaknesses. He saves us from our sinfulness. And he makes us clean and good and strong. Then you have a normal, unegotistical, natural, realistic, objective confidence in your own self because you are God's child and you can handle things. Over the course of the years which I've known this church, I have seen literally hundreds of people have their lives changed. I've seen them come in this church weak, defeated, ashamed, and I've seen them catch something of the, of the uh, beautiful spirit of fellowship and love and faith that is here, and they've become different people. We had an usher once who was a drunk, and he got changed, and we made him an usher. Now, don't think that the ushers that let you in today are all ex-drunk. <laughs> This was only this one. And he said to me, I don't think I want this job because what if I have to usher to a seat one of my old drinking companions? I said, then you just tell him, you're exhibit A <laughs> of what the church can do to change people's lives and give them confidence. Well, there was another man named Dick. I'll not tell you his last name. He was about as defeated a human being as I've ever seen. He got to coming to Marble Collegiate Church by means of the radio, which indicates that the radio is a good thing to do because you send it out and you catch people in a moment of uh, deep concern about themselves. You bring them into the church, and then the church has its marvelous opportunity to uh, weave its ancient alchemy upon them. You bring them up next to the Savior, and the Savior changes them. So, 
Dick came here. He was a completely defeated man. And then one day he wrote me this letter. When we think of all the wonderful things that have happened to us since we started coming to Marble Collegiate Church, it seems nothing short of a miracle. When you remember that just six years ago I was totally broke, in fact thousands of dollars in debt, a complete physical washout, and had hardly a friend in the world because of my excessive drinking, you can see why we have to pinch ourselves that our good fortune isn't all a dream. I never in all my life had had any real confidence in myself until I came to Marble and found the Lord. I am one of those people that have to do a day-to-day -day job on myself, but gradually by following your teachings, the Lord has so changed my life that it is like being awakened and released from a prison. I just never dreamed life could be so full and wonderful. Sign, Dick. That's what happened in this great old church and in many other churches. Your life can be changed and when it's changed, everything changes. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this ancient message, but modern up to the minute message of Jesus Christ that he alone has the answer for human beings now, as well as in all the centuries that have passed by. Bless every member of this congregation here today. And if anyone here needs changing, grant that that mysterious and marvelous thing can take place where that person could say, I never dreamed that life could be so wonderful. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.